here this morning. My name is Beth Altringer. I'm the uh, founder and director of the Desirability Lab at Harvard University in the engineering school. I'm so excited to be moderating this panel because this is really, uh, all of these speakers are at the forefront of what we study. So we study what, uh, why people like what they like and we use enormous data sets to do that. And so this topic is right on, on, on topic with my interests as well. So, I'd like to start off with Christina, uh, digitizing consumer and brand relationship management and uh, the ways your organization is using data to make these rel relationships more visible, more actionable, and more measurable. Could you tell us more about how the answer to how companies do this, and your company in particular, has changed over the last five or 10 years? Sure. Um, I guess I just need to kind of give in the context a little bit of uh, like a context setting for the crowd, because not everyone is very familiar with the digital ecosystem in China. So basically, you know, people know about Alibaba, but then uh, what they don't know about is actually the digital ecosystem both around the consumer life is most easily set like almost like a combination of Amazon, Google, and social platforms like Facebook and Twitter in the US. So given that data um, ecosystem and in the infrastructure that Alibaba has, actually we have the ability to enable the brands and the brand building partners in the entire community to really drive end-to-end -end brand building with effectiveness and efficiency. Um, that is actually the reason why we created a unimarketing methodology and portfolio of tools um, to accomplish that. I think you know, Mark probably has a bit of a, um, knowledge and experience is about that. Um, you know, the PNG China team um, has ab done absolutely fantastic things with that. So we only kind of you know, um, introduced that system 18 months ago. Um, I would say a lot of brands um, and brand builders have really embraced this, and then they're doing a lot of learning and experimentations. Um, with their own resources and organizational capabilities. Um, that is how you know, we feel Alibaba as a platform to really you know, be able to provide and empower. Um, and I guess a lot of people ask me also, what do we see you know, this like in five to 10 years with continuous um, development of technology and maturation of data? Um, my personal point of view is you know, a lot of people talking about marketing automation, but I guess you know, my view is in five to 10 years, marketing automation will become a reality. And you know, um, of course, you know, a lot of marketers are contempl contemplating this and then you know, think about what is the role of marketing and creative or creativity in the entire marketing automation context. And I guess you know, it is important to understand there are things that machine and AI will not take away from human being. That is the originality, that is the creative power, that is the idea, that is the strategic choices that we're making. Um, that is the ability to create demand and delight consumers by creating the right experiences. Um, so I think these will remain the sort of essence of business growth and brand building, and then this will not be taken away um, by you know, AI, you know, data or technology. Um, but the rest of the optimization, like real-time optimization, can be hugely enhanced um, by AI or algorithm. So how do you see, like, how does this work today at Alibaba? How, how is the integration of the creative side and the data side coming together to make decisions? Um, well, that is another interesting um, aspect of our sort of you know, um, overall um, capability that we provide to brands um, and their partners, right? So I give you an example. I'm sure a lot of people, if not know Alibaba at all, have at least heard Double Eleven Day, right? That is the single day, uh, or whatever you call it. Um, so apart from the like the the, the, the massive, like the sales revenue number, right? Um, we also think about how to kind of really help brands to do better because 
only within 24 hours, last um, double 11 actually, we had used AI to create or you know create personalized banner um, ad. That quantity was 170 million wow. within 24 hours. Wow. And you've asked me, you know, going back to the topic like mm -hmm. algorithm versus creativity, mm -hmm. the sort of execution mm -hmm. or optimization mm -hmm. of the content. That is a huge opportunity for AI or algorithm to help brands with. Yeah. I guess you know we just need to be comfortable with that mm -hmm. trend. That's great. That's a great segue for uh, my next question for Shailish. Uh, can you explain the process behind how the post defines its audience segments uh, and the data that feeds into those? Sure. So um, if you look at uh, the news landscape in the last one year or so, maybe about 18 months, one thing is becoming apparently clear, that people are willing to pay for news. This has been a big, big shift um, in, I would say, the last 18 months to two years. So we are focused at the post on subscriptions. Mm -hmm. So our data strategy, our segmentation, um, we use that significantly to try and understand propensity of a consumer to subscribe. So, you know, their reading habits, um, the type of content that they use, the devices that they come to us from, the area that you come from, we use that data, couple that with what we can get from platforms like Facebook and Google, add our secret sauce on that, and try to figure out what is your propensity to subscribe. And depending on your propensity to subscribe, you may see a different message and a different uh, flow in your checkout process. And sometimes there's um, a discussion on is the fact that publishers like the Washington Post that we are focusing so much on subscribers, what does it mean to our advertising business? The good news is that they are synergistic. What we see is that once we get subscribers, they tend to consume a lot more page views. And their tastes become much more broader than when they first visited. So for example, you know, they may, come, they may have been coming to the post for the steak and the lobster, but once they become subscribers, they tend to enjoy the soup and the salad and the desert and everything else that we offer. And so, uh, the, the goal to get more subscribers really is very synergistic with the goal to drive advertising revenue. And that really is the heart of our data segmentation strategy at The Post. Great. And, and following up on that, in which, um, in which categories does your data perform best and worst? So, I mean, the, the fidelity of the data, if you are able to convert somebody into a subscriber, mm -hmm. is so much stronger than if you are a one-hit wonder that comes, snacks, and leaves. And um, the paywall at the Washington Post is down to three pieces of content a month. So if you come to us and read more than three articles a month, you are shown the paywall. So it's a very, very tight paywall. But something that is perhaps counterintuitive is that in most sites, including The Post, we have about 100 million uniques a month, uh, just in the US audience alone, is that the vast majority of users who come to us, even though our paywall is set at three articles a month, never hit the wall. Mm -hmm. So when you talk about what data performs the best for us, it's the data that we get once you're a subscriber because our relationship with you is so much deeper. But if you are a one-hit wonder, which is a very large swath of our audience, it is difficult for us to try and figure out on our own what you may or may not like in our strategy. So the best performing data is the data we get from our subscribers, and the least performing are the ones that we are getting as one-hit wonders. Great. Makes sense. Uh, Mark, we spoke a little bit yesterday about how um, P&G is currently implementing a strategy that started as, as many as uh, eight, about eight years ago or something like that. Could you speak a little bit more about how that's changed and what is different about today that's allowing you to really act on the strategy that you developed? 
Yeah, when, uh, when I started as a CMO a decade ago, we had about 2% of our media was in digital, and that was mostly search. And as we got into it, what we saw, the promise of digital was coming, uh, but, and Facebook was, had about 100 million users. YouTube was a separate company, was not part of, of Google at all, so we didn't think about that. But a couple of years later, uh, they started, they started come, becoming big. When they started getting to 250, 300 million users, when YouTube bought, or Google was bought, bought YouTube, we started saying, okay, this is starting to look like a marketing tool and the ability to do marketing with it. Now, we had in our mind something that we had developed called Brand Building 2020. Brand Building 2020 was this special program that we developed that was a vision for the future. And the vision for the future was that brand building will become creating one-to-one -one relationships with consumers to be able to give them the, what they really need. The problem was is that the data wasn't there and the technology wasn't there. So we worked with what we had, Facebook and Google at the time, built up pretty much mass marketing with digital that didn't turn out to have the same promise that we looked for. So fast forward to today. With a lot of partners, which including like the Alibabas of the world, now we really have the tools. We have the data. We have the consumer data. We have the data and analytics technology. And we have things like propensity modeling to work with, with, with folks like Alibaba to be able to get that precise one-to-one -one relationship with consumers and do it on a scaled basis. We've got AI, like the Olay Skin Advisor that I showed you, which is not an ad. It's a utility. So that's the difference. And what I think is exciting about today's world is that there's no limits to what we can do. It's all really our, our imagination is the only limit when it comes to what we can do. If we take the mindset of we want to make, we want to solve problems for consumers, we want to make the experience better for consumers, we want to drive the kind of, the kind of deep engagement. We have a great relationship with Alibaba. Uh, 18 months ago, um, maybe, it was eight, maybe it was two years ago, I don't I'll tell you a story about this. I was in China, because we were nowhere in China. We, we, were, we were actually very traditional just a few years ago in China in terms of our, of our work. We met with Alibaba, who was one of the presidents of your organization, and, and we, we started talking about data and what we can do with it. And you had about, at the time, 700 million people in your database. This uh, president said, it was, it was translated, he said, think about our data as a hotel. You can check into our hotel, you can bring your data, you can mix it with our data, and we'll build the business together inside the Alibaba platform, which has so many different things. So that's a great idea. Can I check out of your hotel? He said, yes, but not with the data. <laughs> okay, fair enough. So what we did is we used that, though, to be able to do things like propensity modeling, to do things like on 11.11, to be able to create bespoke and authentic and um, really uh, individual relationship with people to be able to drive the business. And now we're rocking. That's great. That's great. Uh, David, I, I, when we were speaking before, we briefly realized that we have different opinions about the evolving role of the creative director and how, uh, how data is influencing decision-making in, in, in that particular role. I wonder if you could speak about, you know, do we, do we currently live in a world where innovation and design have become genuinely evidence-based? Uh, and if you believe that, can you elaborate a little bit more? And if you disagree, I'd love to hear more about what you think. Uh, great question, Beth. There's a couple of ways, you know, I, I, I wanted to sort of take more of a contentious view, I think generally on the machine led to human base. And from my perspective, there's a couple of things that sort of strike me as the answers here, which are absolutely appropriate. The challenge is how do you do one to one in a one to many world? And how do you take all of the assembly of metadata and how do you make it feel like it happens in the real time at the right place, right place, right platform, at the right moment? And how do you deliver it in a seamless way that feels frictionless and doesn't feel like it's confronting? Otherwise, you end up with pushback and the whole ecosystem falls apart. So given that's the case, I think there are three things that makes me feel like there are sort of topics de jour. One is data today used to be personal. Well, data previously used to be personalized. 
Hello, Xingyi, welcome to Paris, it's 68 degrees. Big deal. And then it was contextualized. Hello, Xingyi, welcome to Paris, 68 degrees. There's a festival coming and there's a long line to be prepared. And I think where the success of this goes is are you able to identify the needs of people to do predictive? Which is, hey, it's 68 degrees, uh, you have a gap in your calendar, you're spending this time at this event, it looks like you've got time to listen to music in the afternoon because you're a music fan. All of that data is collected in a very unique way that says the output is better than the input that I gave you. And that's the beautiful thing about the assembly of data. The biggest challenge, however, is there's always going to be the happenstance, which is, simply put, data can give you the how, it doesn't give you the what. And I think that's where the creatives come into it, that's where the heart and mind come into it, because at the end of the day, we sell to humans. I was stunned by the power of the Tide commercial on Super Bowl, and I'm not even a football fan, but to say that Tide is in every ad, that was bloody genius. It was, that did that was not, brilliant. I assume that didn't come from an algorithm. And if it yeah. did come from algorithm, I'm floored. Because in a world where we're trying to recognize people's faces and we're trying to understand whether a smile means, are they happy or is it, is it a half frown? Or, you know, when we're trying to identify a feedback loop, we can get caught up in that feedback loop, whether it's sight, sound, or motion. And I think that's a challenge for us to grapple with as marketers, as the people who produce content. As I work with Oath, with the many of the brands that we have, we're trying to identify stuff that feels human from humans and it's frictionless and not just feel like it's stabbing pains of data regurgitated. And so that's why I think it's powerful that creatives still control the what, not the how. Yeah, that's great. Uh, I love that commercial was fantastic. Uh, the fact that it's memorable to all of us is meaningful. Um, following up on the emotion question, David, like as a, as a researcher, like I see where, how the emotion recognition technologies are evolving very rapidly. I wonder how you see that uh, feeding into uh, marketing in the future. There's a couple of things that I think are really interesting, particularly in retail. If you can have AI identify somebody who, the difference between a prospect and a customer, that's powerful. And how can you identify yeah. that? Some could be image recognition, already identified that when I come through the door, I'm already a customer, so when I pick something up, it's already paid for. It's not about weighted, it's all about AI and spatial awareness. Mm -hmm. But also identifying things like thermal, thermal technology. So somebody comes in and their body temperature is higher than you expect, perhaps they're gonna steal something. There's identification that can happen there. So I think a lot of those innovations make very powerful decisions with the machines. The biggest thing I have is how do we identify emotion? And then how do you tune that for need? Because ultimately, then you have to forecast for it. But if I can identify that throughout my day, there are different needs that men, women, age groups are trying to accomplish, can you meet them at that time? And can you get there? We are not there yet. And the promise of that is you could do it with VR, but who the hell wants to walk around with VR on all the time? Yeah. Firstly, you're going to bump into things and you look like a human lunatic. Mm -hmm. So you can identify because it's a, it's a captivating eco chamber, but it's not for the mass. So it, it's only for people who do studies yeah. that can identify. You can understand if you laugh and I cry, mm -hmm. serve me different content. Mm -hmm. But in the real world, it's a harder way to identify the nuances of, of the human culture. Yeah, it's going to be exciting. You know, I probably on a panel like this, even five years from now, We'll have a lot more uh, information about where that's going to go. Um, Shailish, I wonder, so we were speaking uh, before the panel about uh, AI-generated content and how you're already experimenting with that. And I wonder if you could just tell us a little bit more. Sure. So we've been experimenting with two things, really, on the content side. One is generating headlines. Um, headlines and summar summarizations of stories. And the second is to actually try and generate a story itself. Um, and if you're a journalist here, uh, don't worry that technology is at its infancy. Um, what we are doing at The Post is really looking at much more structured data. So uh, the Olympics, for example, you know, uh, sports scores, what happened in the game. Uh, elections is another thing close to our heart. Uh, we cover a lot of the most important races, but what about the races that you know, may not be occurring in precincts that are in the limelight? And if you look at our content consumption, while it's true that uh, the top stories, the top 25, 30, 50 stories, drive a large part of our volume, there's also a very long tail of stories that drive the rest of the traffic, that may cause people to subscribe, 
and definitely drive ad revenue. So with a machine, what we are able to do, for example, is to cover every high school football game in the Virginia, Maryland, DC area, for example, uh, to cover the elections in every precinct in the United States, uh, to cover uh, the sports in the Olympics that nobody may be interested in. And those uh, uh, pages, while they may not drive the majority of our traffic, added together, they drive more than 50% of our page views. Wow. So this is an example of a machine working at scale to drive traffic and ultimately add revenue. Um, and the other thing I want to quickly talk about in terms of auto-generating content um, is that there are so many structured areas, you know, corporate earnings, for example, crime statistics, real estate. These are all areas that have a lot of data and we, uh, our newsrooms, because of the constraints on the number of people we have, basically, tend to cover only the big stories. So the machine does the rest and it does it on every platform. It's not just on the web, it can put it out on Alexa, it can put it out, um, uh, it'll tweet it out, it'll tweet updates out. So you do a lot of content across platforms for the more structured type of environments. That's where we are at right now with respect to automatic content generation. Great. We're, we're, we're getting close to wrapping up, so I w I'd like to hear from uh, Christina and then finish with Mark uh, on the same question. So you've both ha uh, been in positions where so much has changed throughout the course of your career so far. I wonder if you can leave us with um, your thoughts on how the how the HR skills needed to be really competitive in the future have changed. Christina? Oh, that's really a very good and important question. Um, I guess, I think really, um, you know, a lot of hot skills um, can be sort of educated and acquired, right? But I guess in order to um, be successful in a career, there are a number of things that you um, need to bear in mind. One is really your inspiration and determination. Um, oftentimes, it's not about whether you can do it. It's about whether you are determined to do it. Okay? I think never ever let frustrations or failures to kind of, you know, um, um, just uh, shed away where you originally started and set out to be. And the second is really about having that courage um, to change and to also fail forward. I think that is also very, very important. Um, and I think if there is a third one, I think that is really um, being a genuine. I think, you know, um, many people talk about leadership in different ways, but I still believe in authenticity leadership. So I guess, you know, as long as you understand who you are and why you're doing this, and then you really lead yourself and then lead this organization to achieve that, I think this will bring you where you want to be. Thank you. And Mark? Uh, it's an awesome question to end on because as all the CMOs and marketers and agencies in this room are thinking about the future, it's something that we're all thinking about. I can just tell you how we're thinking about it is in, in the past, when you recruit for people, you recruit for functions, functions of work. So marketing function, sales function, R&D, you know, finance and so forth. Increasingly, what we're thinking of is function less or function convergence, bringing them all together and, and, and finding people who have high brain power, extremely high brain power, have the blend of IQ and EQ, and then have chutzpah, which is, which is the, the courage and the drive and the ambition to make things happen and to do good for the world as well as do good for your, for your company. When you get that combination, that's when you get outstanding analytical capability and creative, creative capability that has to blend together to be able to create the kinds of breakthroughs that we want, need, and um, are excited about for the future. Great, thank you. Uh just be, we're transitioning sessions 
VivaTech has been partnering with Google to uh, craft some additional great sessions on marketing and advertising for those of you who want to stay for that. Uh, and I'll, I'll make an announcement welcoming uh, someone to the stage for that. But first, please give a warm, warm uh, thank you to our panel.